other people coming in. All right, if everybody take a seat, we're going to get started. Good afternoon. My name is Karen Meacham. I'm Deputy Director and Fellow within the Global Health Policy Center here at CSIS. Today I have the tremendous honor of introducing Dr. Michael Merson of Duke University, who will discuss the explosion of interest in global health on university campuses across the country. Dr. Merson, I feel, personifies what has inspired a generation of students to go into global health with a career dedicated to service through medicine and public health. He's worked tirelessly to address disease and health disparities worldwide. A brief review of his work includes uh, being chief epidemiologist at the Cholera Research Lab in Dhaka, Bangladesh, researching acute diarrheal disease including cholera. Dr. Merson has held many prominent positions within the World Health Organization as well, first being the director of diarrheal disease con the control program in the 80s. In 87, he was appointed director of the Acute Respiratory Infectious Control Program. And in 1990, became director of the WHO's Global Program on AIDS, where he was responsible for mobilizing and coordinating global health response to the HIV AIDS pandemic. Very big at that time and continually. In 95, Dr. Merson became the first dean of public health at the Yale University School of Medicine, and through 2006 went on to direct research on HIV AIDS prevention at Yale, something he's done significant work on. He's led training programs to build capacity on HIV AIDS prevention in Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Um, Dr. Merson is widely published and also serves in a, as an advisor to UNAIDS, to the Global Fund, Gates Foundation, and many other prestigious institutions. In his spare time, uh, he has played a key role here at CSIS, most recently becoming a member of the Commission on Smart Global Health Policy where he lends his voice and expertise to the, de to the policy debate here in Washington, D.C. Today, Dr. Merson will talk about his most recent work as the founding director of the Duke Global Health Institute, where he uses his experience to educate and guide the tremendous population of students towards careers in global public health. He'll also discuss the Consortium of Universities for Global Health uh, which was recently formed to define and direct and encourage this wave of student interest. So with that, uh, thank you, and please let's welcome Dr. Merson. So I'm on now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Karen. Um, let me first uh, say that it's a, for your very kind remarks, but really what I want to first say is that CSIS is a very special place, and Thank you for inviting me to be here. Uh, I have come in many different capacities. Steve Marson couldn't be here but, um, today, but Steve and I go back to some of the early work that was done on AIDS here and the visits we made and the commission, the, um, and it was a working group or that we had. Task force really made a huge difference on the Hill. And um, I have great admiration for what CSI do, CSIS does. To me, it's the epitome, the example of what a, a Washington, quote, think tank or um, Washington group that really wants to make a difference uh, in, in, uh, in the world uh, should be. And I have great respect for it, and I'm just delighted always to be here. Um, I also want to acknowledge in the audience, uh, particularly given the topic, a few people like Jim Sherry, who's the dean at uh, public health school here at GW, and uh, Guy Pfefferman, who works with a lot of the business schools, um, and there may be some of you else here from other academic institutions, and uh, if I say anything that isn't right, please raise your hand and, and correct me, or if you feel differently, please say so. Um, I'd like to keep this somewhat informal. Um, I didn't expect a room like this, but, but I want you to feel that you can comment or ask questions as we go along. We wait to the end. I don't feel strongly one way or the other. What I want to do is do three things. Um, I want to talk about the context of global health, and then I want to talk about the consortium that we're in, or trying to set up, and what's going on in some universities. And again, I hope some of you will, will chip in from your own experience. And then talk a little bit about, in the end, about how I think the US government can, maybe universities could partner a little more 
and what universities can do in global health in general, that uh, given this incredible enthusiasm that is going on today. Um, I should tell you that uh, the, the bottom, one of the bottom lines I want to start off by saying, looking at the audience, but um, if I had one message to, that I'm going to give you is that we owe it to students. We owe it to today's youth uh, more than anything else. Uh, I was talking to uh, John Donnelly this morning. You may know him. He used to work for the Boston Globe. And we were talking about what's, from the perspective of the media, what, what's made the big difference and what's really caused this global health phenomenon to occur. And I think there's a universal feeling that we owe it to the students. So those of you who have recently been students or are still students, um, you are really behind a lot of what's happened today, and you should, you should be proud of that. You're way ahead of the, of the faculty and the deans and presidents of universities in, in your enthusiasm and understanding of the field and what it, what it means. So for those of you here, I don't know how many students are here. Are there any students here? But, oh, great. Okay. I'm glad I said that then. So uh, what is global health? <coughs> I often get asked that question, what is global health? So the students who just graduated, <laughs> what is global health? I mean, I don't know whether you ever, any professor ever asked you that question. Um, so we've tried to uh, say what global health is. And here you see um, uh, an effort. Study, research, and practice. It's an area, not a discipline, involving study, research, and practice. Our focus is on equity. Um, where it, it emphasizes transnational health issues, determinants, and solutions. It involves many disciplines within and beyond the health sciences, promotes interdisciplinary collaboration, and is a synthesis of population-based prevention and individual-level care. That's a mouthful. So if you want to read the paper about it, about uh, a month ago now, I think, uh, there was a paper in The Lancet, a bunch of us uh, in the field from developing and developing countries put out this definition, and I'll show you another slide in a minute. And we've had a lot of interesting letters to us, uh, many people who don't like it, many people who do like it. And it was, it was put out there to start the debate. It's not meant to be the end of the debate. It's just an effort to try to define a new field. New fields come and go in academia, women's, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, there was this whole, you know, women's studies, environmental studies. You know, academia is slow. Those of you who are in academia or remember academia, things don't happen quickly in academia. But new fields do start, and this is a new field. And uh, we're going to figure it out, a good definition, as we go along. So this was not meant to lock anything in stone. And you can see, oh, wait, I have to do it this way, that this is not projecting very well. but. I will just say here, this is trying to compare, com compare global health, international health, and public health. Three terms that are very frequently used. So here's that definition of global health, okay, that I just went through. Uh, transcends national boundaries, global cooperation, prevention and, prevention and care, health equity for all nations, highly interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary within and beyond sciences. So that's the essence of global health. Now, what about the term international health? It's a term that's still used in many textbooks and, and around the world. And for the most part, it's talking about health issues or, uh, um, of other countries than other than one's own. Uh, it usually involves binational cooperation, and it has prevention and care, and it seeks to help people of other nations. So when the term international health traditionally means when the U historically, when the UK wanted to help its colonies, when the French wanted to help its colonies, and when the US um, years ago felt you know, foreign aid was helping others. We weren't really, it was nothing to do with our health, it was helping other people. That was the term, that's really where the term international health more or less comes from. And then you have the term public health, and of course, this gets a little grayer, the difference between public health and global health, and, uh, and there there is room for more discussion perhaps. But public health, for the most part, it doesn't focus so much on uh, issues that transcend national boundaries, 
but more on populations in a particular community or a nation. It, uh, it's not as often involving global cooperation. It's more focused usually on prevention than care. And its health equity issues are usually more within a nation or community. And it's not, um, it, it certainly is, is multidisciplinary, but more within the health and social sciences. So there's a grayer area between global health and public health. I accept that. And we're trying to figure out ourselves together with our colleagues, you know, having been a public health school dean, how we're, how we're going to work this out. I think with the international health is a very clear difference in the way we approach global problems. Really, international health was a one-way street. In global health, we do mean global health, the world as a whole. We can come back to that if you're interested. Now, one of the issues within the context of global health is the challenge. And there is a mistaken, I think, belief that global health is infectious diseases. And, and we really need to dispel that uh, in terms of any, any of the parameters that you want to look at of what the leading global health problems are today. Certainly infectious diseases, HIV, TB, and malaria, and particularly in the poorest nations, in sub-Saharan Africa in particular, we wouldn't doubt that. But chronic diseases, clearly cardiovascular disease and, and, and obesity and diabetes and hypertension and cancer are more and more becoming the leading killers in the world. Everywhere, even I mean, those of you who travel in urban Africa, how many friends do you have in men in their 50s who've died of stroke? It's, it's, it's really become an epidemic. 20% uh, of Chinese are hypertensive men. So we know that, that chronic diseases are really the coming, the coming problems. Uh, when I'm asked, you know, what's the, what are the big health problems in the world? What's the big risk factors in the world? Well, certainly you'd have to say AIDS, um, particularly in Africa, but smoking and obesity. You have a, a billion people on the planet, one billion, that are going to die from the consequences of tobacco. So how can we just think that global health is an infectious disease? It's just, it's just not what the data shows. And then, of course, the environment. Um, I often tell my students that my generation didn't do a very good job dealing with the AIDS pandemic. And it's going to be up to this generation, our new, new student generation, to, to figure out how much we're going to suffer from climate change and air pollution and, and the environmental threats around us. And they are real. We got too much water in places. We don't have enough water, in, even in this country. Yeah, as you know, in the, west co in the western part of this country, we have terrible drought. But, but, but seriously, the, the, the environmental consequences, the health consequences of our environmental uh, problems are huge. And they have to be in the realm of global health. Social determinants, you know, it's not just the diseases, but the determinants. Those of, we work in, in global health. What I, what I, again, emphasize, it's not just the diseases. We're not just doctors treating diseases. We have to be as concerned with why they occur. What are the social, economic determinants? Gender, poverty, education, culture, we can go on and on. And then, of course, the, the issue that always gets neglected, the system. Um, as someone who's worked for many years, uh, I have some guilt about this. As someone who worked for many years in vertical programs, we all thought back in the 90s and 80s that if we just did immunization programs or diarrhea programs or malaria programs or this program, we would drive the health system. And we would strengthen the health system by making, it, by making our vertical programs work. Well, how wrong we were. Because here we stand now in a situation where our health systems are really in need of strengthening as health systems, not because they deliver AIDS programs or MCH programs or any other programs. But we need to focus on health manpower issues. We need to focus on the system, on the management of the system, on the policies of the system as a system. Or our interventions we've learned, we're just going to go so far in what we're going to be able to achieve. That, that's a critical component of global health. So when we think of global health, in an academic sense at least, that's just a quick picture of the kind of things. And there are others. You know, I haven't mentioned road accidents. I mean, uh, migration issues. We can go on of some of the other priorities. Mental health, huge issue, uh, uh, neglected for the most part right now in the field of global health. But one that's crying for attention in the field is the field of mental health. So I just want to make, I mean, it's a critical point in understanding the field. Now that is, here is a projection of global burden of disease, and it's just a bunch of arrows, I know. But what it shows here is that between 2004 and 2030, 
we're going to see a shift in the global burden of disease. And, and what's going to be uh, number one on the right there is depression. So in, in, in 2030, our leading cause of disability adjusted life years is going to be unipolar depression, and then heart disease, and then road traffic accidents, and then cerebrovascular disease, and then chronic lung disease. So that's where the world is headed. So when you, run a, when you have the privilege of running a global institute, and you're thinking about what your research priorities are, and you're thinking about the world in 20 years, that's, those are the issues that are going to predominate. We're still going to have our infectious diseases, for sure, and our pandemics, no question. But the world, as we develop more, and populations get uh, richer uh, and more middle class. Wh where's the largest middle class in the world right now? Okay, I don't know how many of you would have guessed, but it's, it's certainly not the United States, it's India. And China's a close second, will soon overtake India. That's where the, that's where the global burdens are, in the mostly in these transition countries, and even as I mentioned, in urban Africa. So again, thinking about the, the context of which we're, we, we deal with global health. Now, global health, though, is not just disease and determinants. These are all the actions, why, uh, reasons why we need to take action on global health. Let me, let me get some, some water. The first one is security. And uh, my God, I'm in a security institute. <laughs> um, and you, you've defined it. Uh, the best example are pandemics. I think, how many of you know, how, what's your estimate of the number of pandemics that we, new organisms, let me put it this way, new organisms that we have each year that we have been discovered? Anyone want to guess? Say about one a year. We get a new organism or, a new or, or an organism that comes back, becomes emerging, that was sort of dormant, almost one per year in the last 40 years. Two-thirds are viral and two-thirds are zoonotic. That's a very, and, and that's what's leading to a lot of our pandemics. Uh, and that, those are, that's a good example of security threats. Uh, what, if, what if H1N1, what if H1N1 had a 50% mortality rate? Probably I wouldn't be here. But what if H1N1 had a 50% mortality rate? And just think about that. Would you think about that, what that would mean? It might eventually have that, hopefully not. But what if we have a new pathogen that comes along with that kind of uh, virulence? That could certainly result in serious security problems for everyone. Diplomacy. Sometimes global health uh, works when other politics don't work. Where is the US most popular in the world today? Africa. Why? PEPFAR. Whatever you think of the previous administration, you have to give that administration great credit for PEPFAR. Whatever the reasons for starting PEPFAR, it's done a tremendous amount to promote the uh, United States abroad. And you know, President Obama talks about improving America's image abroad. Global health's a great way to do it. Um, science. Most discoveries in science today are not one person who has a brilliant idea and that's, they figure it out on their own. That's not the way science works anymore. Most of our great dis discoveries are step by step. You know, most Nobel Prize winners, I think two thirds get to do their discoveries before the age of 35. But they do it by working together and building on science that others have done. So global cooperation around science is huge. And that's how we make, that's how we make our discoveries. So global health is terribly important for science. Sustainable development. I think one thing that's really clear now is that if we're gonna have healthy populations, if we're going to have development, we need healthy populations. And if, if we want healthy populations, we need development. The development, in fact, the field of development econ economics across U.S. universities has really come forward again as a great specialty area. And more and more young people going into economics are going into development economics, thank goodness, because it's a field that had been dormant for a number of years. Commodities. Global health is $3.5 trillion business in the world. Drugs, vaccines, diagnostics, uh, prosthetics. So from the standpoint of the business world, global health is big. Has a lot, uh, a great importance to the business sector. Global public goods. There are, global public health goods means that there are certain, 
uh, certain given rights, not rights, but certain, certain given actions that, that um, we all benefit from, like smallpox eradication. That's another reason why we take action on global health, because we want to achieve some global public goods. Another one is the Convention on uh, Tobacco. That's another global public good. And then another, finally, reason why we take action on global health is because of human rights. I would say for students, certainly in the past decade, the price of antiretroviral drugs was a major factor, and the human rights issues around that were a major factor in, interest, in interesting a lot of young people and bringing a lot of human rights activists into the field of AIDS was the fight over the, the price of antiretrovirals, which are now down to you know, almost less than $200 a year when they were $15,000 a year when this whole AIDS pandemic started. And, you know, that's a considerable drop. So there's a great achievement in health and human rights. So, again, the field of global health, it's not just diseases. It also is determinants. But it also involves security, diplomacy, innovative science, sustainable development, commodity, business, global public goods, and human rights. It's why the field is interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and captivating so many people around campuses. Now, of course, we, in the context of talking about what's going on at universities, there's the question of development assistance. And this was published in last week's Lancet. If you haven't read the paper, I urge you to read it. It's just showing you the growth in global health. Uh, 22, well, if you can see it's uh, uh, between 1990 and 2007. And you can see it's up to $22 billion in assistance for health now by 2007. And um, you can see the bottom is AIDS. And, and there's been significant growth in AIDS and malaria. But that's substantial. Look at that growth. And then here's the growth in the United States. Uh, almost $10 billion last year uh, from the U.S. government alone in global health. That's, that's a significant, you know, it's a, more than a doubling in five years. And then if you ask where the money has gone, and this has been a sh great change, uh, of the $9.6 billion in 2008, uh, you can see this is from Jen Cates' stuff at Kaiser, um, almost half is now at state with OGAC. So, of course, the AIDS... Uh, PEPFAR has played a major role in that, uh, and AID, of course, and then the rest with uh, much smaller except the NIH budget, which is about 10 percent of um, global health money, although a small percent of the total, uh, total budget of NIH. So you can see here that's the growth in the U.S. So th again, the context that global health has a lot more resources uh, internationally and nationally. Now, this is a, st a slide based on a talk that Steve Morrison gave. U.S. policy, though, despite all this funding, does have some interesting challenges, and I'm going to come back to this at the end. Uh, there are like 21 different agencies in the U.S. government that are involved in global health. No offense to anyone here from an agency. It's just a, just a fact. 21 different agencies doing global health. Most of our money is going into AIDS. Uh, we have an interesting debate going on, on on whether global health is public health or or foreign policy. And our global health policies tend to be Africa-centric, uh, and um, they overwhelm, uh, in some cases, other bilateral programs. And we have an interesting tension in our global health policy in the U.S. between vertical and horizontal efforts. You saw that from the previous slide, all that money going into AIDS, almost nothing going into health systems. So I think, I think we're at a very interesting time in the U.S. and globally. We have a lot of money, and we have some interesting policy decisions we have to make, taking into account the previous slides I showed you on global burden of disease and what we even mean by global health. The last point I want to make before I get to universities is the current economic context. Very often I get asked, why are you even talking about the rest of the world. What a mess we're in. Well, shouldn't we worry about ourselves? I mean, why, why are you even thinking of the rest of the world? Well, these are just some facts. The poor are the most affected by economic downturns, most out-of-pocket, most more out-of-pocket uh, out extended. The poor are most affected because you have, they have to spend more out-of-pocket 
There's less expenditures by government, and there's less foreign assistance. So we know that in the face of an economic decline in the world, the poor are going to suffer the, the most. We already have heard, it's been in the press, that up to 90 million more people are living in poverty this year alone. We anticipate there'll be an additional 400,000 deaths in children in low and middle income countries and 45 million more children malnourished over the next 18 months. Similar impact expected on women's health. We'll talk about this in the, at the end, but this is why it's good that the Obama administration is thinking of a maternal and child health initiative. And certainly a cut in foreign assistance won't reverse, would, would, would reverse the hard, word, hard won gains that we've had in the past five years in a number of areas. It would undermine global surveillance of flu and TB and other important organisms, and it would hurt our image abroad. You know, the word out there on the streets, the U.S. created this crisis. So it wouldn't be so smart politically for us to cut back our foreign aid at the same time. I mean, that is what you hear on the street. So I would argue that uh, we've got a challenge ahead of us, but this is not a time to cut back our efforts in global health. Um, okay, so let's turn to universities now. That, what I hope I've done there is I've set the context for you on what global health means in, in a broad sense. Definition, disease problems, the multidisciplinary nature of it, the, 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 it's... it's, it's um, importance beyond the health sector, all these issues I mentioned of security and, and commodity. And I've given you a picture of the finances right now. So let's talk about universities. Now, this is just one slide, which shows you in one of our programs at Duke, uh, uh, our Global Health Certificate, um, which is a uh, program for undergraduates. So in 2007, there were two students. It was a new program. And by 2011, there'll be 60. This is just undergrads at Duke taking what we call a certificate. It's uh, what you would maybe meant some of your students have minors in your college, so this would be like a minor. Um, and I'm, I'll talk a little bit more about Duke later. But I'm only introducing this as the example. I, you know, there are many universities that can show you a slide like this in one or two or three or four or five of their programs. And the question is why? Why has this happened? Why have we seen this enormous growth on university campuses? Now, I don't know the answer to it, but I'm going to give you some ideas, and maybe some of you are going to give me ideas. Um, so I've got a list of ideas here, but I'm going to go right to the bottom idea first. And um, David Brooks wrote a column in the Times around uh, when there was a lot of talk about why so many students were out there campaigning in the last election. And I thought his observation was very interesting um, as it applies to global health. And what he said was, our current young generation has an unconsummated desire for sacrifice and service. Um, I don't have any data to prove that, but I believe it. Um, and, and I'd like to think, you know, I'm from the 60s generation, those of you who joined me in the 60s generation, I think we had some of that. We were reacting to a war, many of us, in Vietnam. Uh, but I don't, I think the students of today, they're reacting too to things around them. Uh, I was teaching I, I, last semester when I went to meet some of the freshmen in our focus program. We have a thing called Focus, which is for freshmen, and 30 students in the class. And I asked, how many of you, uh, first week of class, how many of you are just coming to college, how many of you have in high school went abroad? Over half raised their hand. How many of you have been to Africa? 40%. As high school students. When I grew up, it was a big deal to go to New York and see a Yankee game. <laughs> okay? When my wife grew up, it was a big deal to take to get in her truck and go to Chicago to see the, go to Wrigley Field and watch a Cubs game, okay? So, so that's what it was like when I grew up. But the students who grow up today, they're in a whole nother world. I don't think our faculty get it, but all of them. But the students that come today, they've, they've, been, they've, they've got these devices, I don't know, these social networking things. I just heard about Facebook, you know? <laughs> but but they, 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 you know, since they've been young, they've been on the web. They've seen it all. They hear it all. They've got friends all over the world. 
now they've got all these Twitters and Twatters and social networking and, you know, I don't get it, but, but they get it. And, and, and so they've got an information technology boom. They've got rock stars out there, right? Everyone knows, say Bono, what do they know? Everybody knows, it's you too. I just learned that. But, but, they, all, but they, know that, they know that he means something. He's, he was able to really push for global health. The G8 is terrified of him. Okay? So, so I think that you have movie stars, you have rock stars who really have caught on. George Clooney. I mean, we can go on. We can, I, I'm learning some new names, you know. But, but I, I think that this is, this is you have, so, and then you have the social justice movement that I already mentioned touches students on the access to drugs. And then you have um, what I somehow find hard to, to um, to quantify, and that's this response to the 9-11 in Iraq war, and this desire to show we're a better nation. Okay, it's hard to quantify that. So you have all these impacts on, on the current generation, and then you have other factors. You have the pandemics in the news, SARS, AIDS, I have avian flu, I should put swine flu. I mean, so we have, we have all these pandemics that make it food illnesses. We have a, 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 a pathogen that gets into food from Mexico that comes here. We have all these, we have these diseases that travel w with, with food importation. And then we have, of course, the philanthropy. I've already mentioned the government's money, but look at Bill Gates. Gates Foundation, by far, by far, the biggest foundation in the world. Three billion dollars a year on global health. Three billion dollars a year. And Bill Gates himself has just, you know, as you know, left Microsoft and is president of the foundation. Um, and then, of course, the faculty. I think what you're finding, because global health is so interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary, you get faculty from m almost all, well, all schools, at least at Duke, from all our schools, and in arts and science, from many departments, that feel that they have a role, they see their place in global health academically or, or, or edu from the education standpoint. But I come back to the last bullet, which is that this generation really cares. For whatever the reasons, this generation cares, and global health and, the, I hope, the environment are the two things where they can really demonstrate that they care. And so I use that, again, as my, my final point here. Now, I'll show you, it's not just the students, not only the young people. Um, about when was this done? About a month ago, Karen, uh, the, the, the Kaiser survey in May? Anyone here from Kaiser? No, okay. March it was done? Okay. So this was a nationwide survey of what does the American public think of global health. It was published on the web. And got some PR. I'm just going to show you a few of the slides. So the majority of people, this was a nationwide survey. The majority say that developed nations are not doing enough to improve health for people in developing countries. 57% not doing enough of the people surveyed. Even in the current economic climate, this is from March, 28% doing enough, 4%, 14% didn't know. But 57% of the American public, and this is really interesting. So the question was asked, tell me why you think the U.S. should do more to improve health in developing countries. Look at the predominant answer. It surprised me. 47% because it's the right thing to do. It's what we, it comes back to our, what I was saying about students. This is from the American public, the national survey. And then, this really surprised me. Have you personally ever donated money to an organization that works to improve health for people in developing countries or not? First, the first circle. 50% gave money last year for something to do with health in the developing world. That's an astounding figure. Now, much of that, I think, it's not in the survey, is through churches. And that's fine. I mean, so it's hard. I, I don't have the detail of the breakdown of who they gave money to, what organization. That's an impressive figure. So I think the student context has to be seen in the population context and then this issue of enlightened self-interest, where we have to be honest and say it's, it's students care and the public cares, but our government interest 
and our political leaders' interest is also there's some enlightened self-interest. We're afraid of outbreaks and pandemics. We want to repair U.S. image abroad. We want to ensure economic development, and we want to fight poverty. So I don't want it to sound like this is all just being good guys. There's also an enlightened self-interest part to the interest in global health. I don't think it's the predominant one, but I think we have to be honest and say that it's a that our own government's interest is somewhat due to enlightened self-interest. But I do think the fundamental drive on American campuses, I want to come back, is the students. In the context of the, uh, the public interest and in enlightened context of enlightened self-interest. So we, last year, we formed a consortium, well, we had a group of 20 universities that got together and say, hey, let's talk about what's going on. And we decided, we had a meeting out in California and, uh, in September 2008. We got 20 universities together. We're going to have a second meeting this September here in Washington. We've invited 52 universities. Now, in that initial 20, this was, we said, okay, we're going to invite initially 20 universities that have multiple parts of their university that are involved. They have some university resources. They're designated. There's a designated leader. Education and research activities are part of their portfolio, and they have overseas collaborators. And so we 20 met, and we decided to form this consortium, formally form this consortium. And now we've invited 53 schools. We have a board of directors now. We're incorporating ourselves as a 5013C. It's going to be called the Consortium of Universities in Global Health. Our, our secretariat, our, our, we're housed for the first three years at the Global Health Science Division at UCSF, and we have some initial support from Gates and Rockefeller, but we're going to, of course, have to charge dues, like all, you know, most university uh, groups. But what's exciting about this uh, meeting coming up in September is we invited five university presidents. We figured, you know, we're going to try to be a university consortium. We're not going to be a medical school consortium, a public health school consortium, a business school consortium, because most universities are trying to approach global health across the university. So we thought we'd take a chance and make this a university consortium. So we invited five university presidents to speak. We didn't know how many would accept. We had no idea. All five accepted. So we're going to have a meeting with five university presidents coming and talking with us about what to do with the consortium. That's, that's, not, that's not small fish. I mean, that you can get five university presidents to come to a meeting, and they're pretty busy people. Uh, of course, once one new one was come, the other one says he's coming. But, but still, I mean, this is still an, an impressive, and we really hope to launch this consortium. And we want to promote the university's role in multidisciplinary capacity for tackling major global health challenges. We want to build university collaborations to define global health competencies and set standards for training, we want to strengthen the university's capacities to provide seamless global health experiences for students and researchers. We want to provide a platform for exchange of knowledge and experience in global health. These are some of the initial goals we've put forward, but we'll work on this more uh, at our meeting in September. Actually, NIH is hosting us. We're very pleased about that uh, on the 14th and 15th of September. We did a little, now, one of the things I don't have to show you, I wish I had to show you, is data from these 53 schools. How many students are doing what? How many faculty are doing what? I don't have that data. We're still young. We're st we, next week, we will be starting to survey all 53 universities with a common questionnaire to try to get this data for our um, meeting in September, also for our event on the 16th, Karen, because we want to have some data that we can show is going on around Around the, around the United States, and also five universities in Canada. This has become a big issue, big hot, um, hot field in Canada as well. And, you, and the, we did do a quick survey and, of our own, and we found that 41 of the 52 schools do have activities that are into school. 26 the universities are actually giving hard money to their global health entity, whatever that is. 44 have education and research programs and 41 have formal partnerships or exchange of students and research. We've got to do a lot better of documenting what we, what's going on. Uh, right now, what I've told you is just you know, from my own experience, but I, I think this is our, our goal over the next uh, couple of months. This slide is too small, but I was going to just say, wanted to, the reason why I put this slide up, this is Duke, Emory, 
Harvard, Johns Hopkins, University of California, San Francisco, University of Washington. I put those up because each one of those universities has somebody on the initial board of directors. But uh, the reason why I put it up is I want you to realize that each university is approaching global health in a different way. There's no magic formula. So at Duke, we have a tra uh, that I direct, I'm privileged to direct, we have a trans university institute. I'm half owned by the provost and half owned by the chancellor of the health system. And I sit at a pre under the president. That's one model. Emory also has a trans university institute, very similar model. Harvard, being Harvard, uh, has a diverse structure for global health in various parts of the campus. Strong in the public health school, strong on the, in, the, in the health policy, strong on, in, 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 art, in arts and science on the, on the, in Cambridge, uh, strong in the hospitals like the Brigham. Uh, no real unifying structure, not yet anyway. Uh, Hopkins has a institute of global health, but it only involves medicine, nursing, and public, and Institute of Global Health, but it only involves medicine, nursing, and public health. It doesn't involve the rest of the campus. I'm not saying good or bad. I'm just giving you the different scenarios. UC, UC San Francisco is setting up the first university school, school of global health. It's going to be a very unique situation where they're going to have a center in each of the UC campuses that exist now, and then they're going to have a central um, uh, core, and that's being debated now where that will be. I know California has a budget crisis, so I don't know how fast this is going to occur. They did get a $4 million grant from the Gates Foundation to get this started. Uh, but this is going to be the first school of global health. Quite an interesting concept, making use of the entire California system. It would be quite an experiment. And then University of Washington, uh, they have a global health department, which is made up of, of uh, a combined effort by the medical school and the public health school that has a lot of support from the Gates Foundation. And I could go on. I mean, we can, uh, we can come up with probably 30 different scenarios. It doesn't really matter. But what I wanted to present to you is that there is a, universities are working to figure this out in a, in a context that works best for each of them. And, and um, there's no one way to do it. But the important thing I want to show you is that this is happening uh, across the country. Now at Duke, and you, you allow me five minutes of, of, of a promotion of my own institute, just to tell you what, one, a little bit more about the way we're doing it, okay, without much detail. What I want to, but I'm doing it to emphasize a few points. What happened at Duke, just to give you an example, is that there was a, a committee established um, two years before the institute ever was, was created, to decide what Duke should do in global health. And they decided to have an institute that would reduce health disparities in our local community and worldwide. We consider global health to be global and local. If you go east of I-95 in North Carolina, you, don't, you almost enter a developing country. I mean, it's pretty sad, the kind of disease problems we have in much of the south, as you probably know, particularly in rural areas. Um, and we, we, we are very interdisciplinary, and we are focused on solving problems. That's research and training the next generation. But the most important thing is that our institute spans the humanities, social sciences, engineering, environment, law, divinity, and, and the life sciences, which are medical school and nursing school. We don't have a public health school at Duke. So, so I, think that's, I think it's an example of, 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 of how uh, one university put it all together. And our five goals are to build the next generation of our institute is to build the next generation of scholars, that's education, encourage innovation and promote excellence in research, respond to the policy needs of decision makers, undertake research, service and service learning, and facilitate access to current information. And um, this slide just gives you a picture, I'm not going over this, of all the different education programs we've started, the various research initiatives we've started. That on the left is the number of service programs we've started, and on the right is on policy. I just want to tell you one, one thing that we did on the service side, which, which I hope more universities are going to do. We found that our health system has a lot of surplus supply and equipment that goes on eBay and frankly doesn't sell very well. This stuff is fine to use. It's just, it's just a little out of date. And we convinced the head of our health system to let us take those supplies and equipment and give them to our faculty who are doing research abroad 
so they could give it to their partner institutions as a way of, of giving and, uh, as, a par as part of our partnerships with the various uh, activities we have abroad. So that's just the way in which you can get your health system. Rather than putting their surplus on eBay and barely probably you know, storing it at a, at a huge price, to, instead they gave it to the faculty to give to our partners abroad for the kind of research we do. So just to give you an example of how a university can do things quite uniquely when it comes to global health. And then um, I just well, this is a map of the places where we're doing research around the world. I would say that probably Hopkins has the most international. I think the last time I talked to Tom Quinney had projects and Hopkins had projects in close to 100 countries. So I think they have the, the most partnerships around the world. You can see we're we're quite modest uh, when it, when it comes to that. And then we are also been working with a number of partners around the world to um, designate what we call global health sites where we are hoping to concentrate our research and education efforts um, from the different schools because it gets expensive and you, you build up close relationships, e equal close relationships with partners. And if you're doing an AIDS research, you know, in, in Tanzania we started off in AIDS but we're now working in maternal and child health. Our engineering students are there working on some projects. We have an environmental group there. We're work working on some projects. We have students who are from the various schools. What we find and what more and more universities find is that it's, it's most effective in creating close bilateral partnerships, um, by partnerships that go in both directions rather, that it helps to concentrate your efforts. And you'll find that I think what you would find is more and more universities are doing that. We're actually having a meeting next week at Duke with six other universities in the south between Washington and, and Alabama. We're having a meeting with six universities to talk about how we can share our resources and, and how students from one school can go to a place that another school has a site where education or research can take place so that we don't step on each other's toes, be sensitive to our partners. Um, uh, and then uh, let, me, let me then now just close a few minutes about what I think is some of the issues that we face down the road. So I was thinking, what are the challenges that we face in, 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 in all this enthusiasm that's out there? First, uh, within academia, those of us in global health, we still have to convince our colleagues on the validity and sustainability of global health as an academic field. There, you know, it, took, it took years for women's studies to be accepted on campuses. And I don't expect this to happen overnight. This is a new field. And we have, to, we have to prove ourselves that we are serious scholars and, and, and going to make a serious impact from, a, from an education or a research or a policy standpoint. Secondly, we have to be sure there, and there are reliable career paths for students. Students are not stupid. Students think about what's going to happen when they graduate. Well, they should. Most of them do. So there has to be career paths. Thirdly, we have to make it a truly global field, not just a field in the north. So I mentioned that Canadian Canada has five universities with global health institutes. Well, England now has four. Peter Piat has just gone to Imperial College to start a big global health institute there. I think he spoke here recently. Um, Australia has the Georges Institute, which is a leading institute in, uh, in, in global health. Um, and we've been invited now to start global health diploma programs at Peking University in, in Peking, at Mahidol University in Bangkok, and, it, and then went with the Public Health Foundation of India. Because in, at least in Asia, we're seeing that more, more and more universities want to create academic programs in global health. Again, very much driven by students in those universities. So I think we're going to see this worldwide. Uh, and I know a number of my colleagues are doing similar activities in Africa. We need to determine benchmarks and ways to measure the impact and success of our programs, and we need to maintain the exciting momentum for global health under the current global economic downturn. And, and therefore, I think we need to keep asking ourselves as universities, what can we offer to the field? What do we offer that you can't get from CSIS, or you can't get from Family Health International, or you can't get from uh, the U.S. government. What is it that universities can offer? Or from NIH, what is it that universities can offer? And these are just some thoughts. Obviously, we, we can capture the enthusiasm of students and educate and train future leaders. 
Our scholarship and research of our faculty can address the leading global health challenges I mentioned. We can do objective, hopefully, policy analysis. And we can provide service to our local partners, to civil society, to the US government, to international organizations, and to the private sector. What I mean by that is particularly is in the area of monitoring and evaluation. We've been involved in my institute in a number of projects around the world uh, in the area of monitoring and evaluation, where we've been called on by usually a funder uh, to come in and do some, some serious evaluation work. Um, now, in terms of partnering with the U.S. government, this is a challenge for us. There's, there, there is this thought that, you know, to, with some validity, that universities are slow and we take big overheads. Although I must tell you I've seen some others that take even bigger overheads that are not universities. But I think the question that we need to ask ourselves is how can we partner better with the U.S. government? Traditional relationships have been mostly through HHS, of course NIH, CDC. Department of Defense supports quite a lot of research on universities and the Department of Education, mostly through Fulbright scholars. All that could be expanded. Then we need to think about new relationships with state. As I showed you, state now is half the global health budget of the U.S. government. Hasn't been a lot of collaboration historically between state in, in, and, and universities in the area of health. And that's an area I hope can be established. And then, of course, in the area of policy analysis, I'm sure we can do more to work more closely with the U.S. government. And so I'll finish with this slide, because I want to come back to where I started, which is that what's driving us more than anything is, and I think we should all be very excited about that, is today's youth and the fact that they want a better world. And, you know, Martin Luther King, this quote, as long as there is poverty in the world, I can never be rich. As long as diseases are rampant, I can never be totally healthy. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single dominant destiny, and whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. The point here being that, that health disparities are not, not something we should tolerate, and people who go into this field, um, I think what's at the core of why they're doing it is that they want to remove those disparities. And that's why it's an exciting field, and I hope one that will be around for a long time to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, sure, Dr. Merson. Um, for that well-rounded description of the growing interest in field of study, global public health. I have lots of questions, but I do want to open it to the floor as I think there's, in the interest of time, and I already see some hands. So maybe there are microphones around the room. Um, if you would identify yourself, and I'll take two or three at a time. Great. Carla. Uh, thank you, Dr. Merson. I agree with you that uh, I think you put your finger on the, uh, the very strong interest that young students have uh, in doing the right thing and social justice as, as part of the reason why people go into the field of global health. Um, but I'm worried there's a yawning gap between that humanitarian ethos and what has caused global health issues to get on political agendas uh, over the last 10 years. And if you look at the issues that are at the top of the political agenda, uh, aside from HIV AIDS, but uh, avian flu, H1N1, the International Health Regulation, virus sharing controversy with Indonesia, they bear no resemblance to the burden of disease uh, study in terms of you know, what public health conceives of as the, the future issues of global health. And I worry here that we're doing a great disservice to the students who are coming in with this humanitarian ethos by not giving them uh, training in international relations and foreign policy to understand what role global health really takes uh, in world affairs and how to act on that uh, to make things happen for global health. Uh, so I would hope that Uh, Mike, that was a terrific speech. Um, uh, I just want to encourage you to give a, another tiny addition to it because I think you've, if, if the metaphor is right, you've um, under 
underplayed, un underplayed your trumpet or whatever, uh, because Duke um, is a university which was one of the first which encouraged different schools to, to collaborate. And I remember the conference a couple of years ago on um, health workforce issues where the president of your university brought together everything from divinity to the business school. And um, you also did this uh, pioneering survey of people at WHO, etc., showing a tremendous awareness of the lack of basic management skills. And that's, that's where I wanted to go. And, and you, you did mention health systems, and you did mention that very little money was going towards health systems. But um, I, I wish you'd say a little bit more about these, these issues, because unless you, you have people in the trenches who, who know how to get things done, much less will be getting done, and, and the money won't, won't, won't be useful. My name is Guy Pfefferman. I'm the CEO of uh, the Global Business School Network, and uh, we're working together. One more, maybe? I'm sorry. Could you identify yourself? Just identify yourself. Um, I was wondering if you could further pin down the definition of health system strengthening. I've seen a lot of solicitations out of the government in recent months where they're calling for it, and it's not entirely clear to me that they know what they're asking for. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of, sometimes it's m and &E, sometimes it's evaluation, sometimes it's actual capacity building in HR, and sometimes it's actual systems. Is there any kind of consensus as to what that phrase is going to mean long term? Yeah, so um, your comment is quite interesting. The, the school, so we have uh, nine, nine schools at Duke. The school that's most involved with us is the public policy school. Um, and the students, many of the students who are involved, undergraduates, their major is public policy. Um, I take your point about the disconnect. I tried to show one slide in that regard about how our money is being spent and what our priorities are and what the global burden of disease is. Um, and it's why I'm hoping universities could get a little bit more involved in policy analysis with the U.S. government. Because I, I mean, I understand, I mean, you know the whole genesis of PEPFAR. I think it's public that uh, well, PEPFAR came about f not just because there was a terrible AIDS pandemic. There was issues around the African-American vote, and there were um, issues faith-based. The faith-based sector was, was losing people, literally losing people in, in Africa. So I think... I think that um, the importance of global health in, in the context of international relations is huge. Certainly at Duke, we are focused on that. I, I, gave a, I was asked to talk um, the December before last. It was the annual meeting of um, the Schools of International Relations that is held every December or something. I was asked to come and speak to them. And I was impressed that there was interest in the public policy domain or international relations domain. One of the challenges they faced was not having faculty to teach courses. And, and the reason why I say that, one of our greatest challenges right now, not just at Duke, but in, ac in academia, is not having enough faculty to meet the demand, both for the education, the courses that are needed and wanted, and the, and the research that's out there, and even to participate in, in, in more in the technical support role. Um, how do you get more faculty motivated? How do you get more faculty? Well, either you try to take existing faculty and give them incentives to do their work internationally. Now, most faculty are, they have their thing and they do it well and they want to do it better and then they want to get promoted. It's normal. I don't have any problem with that. But sometimes if you could just get them, in, you know, if they're interested in obesity, in um, in, in, in middle class people in Durham, maybe you can get them interested in obesity in China. I mean, maybe. You send them on a trip and you give them a small pilot grant, and maybe they get, a, maybe they get enthused. Or you try to bring in new faculty. And that's why we need doctoral programs and postdoctoral programs. And we need to find opportunities for young scholars to advance their interests. And that's what I find in the public policy area right now, is, or in the national relations area, is getting those schools to take this on. A, at the, at the administrative level, although at Duke, um, Sanford is great, but, but I think this is a real challenge, but I take your point, and how to get the U.S. government to take a more um, 
balanced view on where to put its money is complex because right now two-thirds of our money is invested in AIDS. And historically, that's going to be hard to change, in my opinion, because you've got a lot, I don't know, 2 million people. I don't know the number, but 1 to 2 million people on HIV as a result of PEPFAR. It's not going to be easy to pull the plug on that. And, and the question is, how do we get sustainability of this PEPFAR effort in the long term? I mean, I think in the short term, we've got to continue to provide resources. But, but, but if, the, if we're not going to get more money, or if we're only going to get a little bit more money, Eventually, we've got to get that age treatment covered in other ways so that we can do other things with the money. I think that's a real great challenge that the U.S. government has now. It's not going to happen quickly. At least we see that there's an interest in expanding into maternal and child health, which is a good sign. So that's um, uh, uh, how I'd respond to that. On the management side, uh, Guy is right, and I, I alluded to it, and it's related to your question about health systems. Um, I mean, think of our own country. Think of the mess we're in in, in our own health system. Uh, I mean, it, and it's not, the, the problems are, some of them are quite common. Um, you know, what often happens in Africa, let's say, is that someone graduates from medical school, and the next year they're running a, a, a clinic in, uh, in, in a rural area. They've had no training whatsoever to run that clinic, none. But they're, the government, they got a job in the government, and they're going to go run a government. Or they're working for a faith-based organization, and, and they're being asked to run a hospital. And they've never run a hospital. They don't have a clue how to run a hospital. So to me, what we need in, in strengthening health systems is we need more people. We have four, we're short 4 million health care workers in the world. Africa has 25% of the disease burden and 3% of the health workforce. So we have a huge need to have more health workers. The nursing crisis worldwide is huge. Okay, so, so we have that problem. I mean, we need more people. That's where you get this health manpower. But then we need training. We need to train people, whoever, physicians or nurses or, or any, you know, or um, people in the, who get MBAs or, or get business training. We need to, to train them in the basic management skills. To, so to me, strengthening health system, of course, means um, more people. It means uh, more hardware, you know, we need more hospitals and health centers, we need more, um, we need to get comfortable with um, what's called e-medicine or e-health, because I think the future in, get, in reaching out to people is going to be through, what, f three, three and a half billion people have cell phones today. So, you know, the way we're going to reach people is by text messaging, uh, in terms of getting, you know, reaching out on health care, I think, and PDAs as they get cheaper. So I, I think that we need, we need to think about people and then the, the hardware that goes in the system and then for the those that are in the system they need to know how to better manage within the system now evaluation I don't I mean I think we should evaluate programs I don't usually that doesn't jump to mind when I think of health systems I'm not saying we shouldn't evaluate but I, it wouldn't be what I would put in the basket of health systems program evaluation it should be done but I I'm, I'm thinking something of the system itself I would refer you to WHO has some very good publications on, the, on a framework for strengthening of health systems, I don't remember the exact reference, where you could get, I think, some very good uh, fundamental definitions of that. And Guy, I agree, um, we, need to, we need to understand that, the, that management needs to be taught in, in many different schools, not just in business schools, not just in medical schools, not just in public health schools, but the concepts of basic health management, uh, even in this country. I mean, how many medical students graduate and even know what Medicare is? I hate to say that to you all, <laughs> but it's true. Uh, and I think we've got our own—we've got similar issues right in our own country in getting in getting our our young doctors and health le and health allied health graduates to learn something about the health system they're going to enter when they finish their education. So I don't know if that answered that, but I tried. Um, maybe, yeah, and then Sandy will and then maybe one more time. Um, I a, there's an old adage about uh, those who, who can do and uh, those who can't teach. <laughs> and as the quintessential exception to that, it's good to have you at the Okay, uh, thank you, Jim. That's Jim Sherry. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, how do we get the reciprocity of this? I mean, the other, the other uh, consequence of 9-11 was such a reduction in the number of foreign students who were coming to mm. the country. Uh, when we saw how the, the uh, ag the Green Revolution was managed. So much of that was focused on building the 
capacities of the network of institutions around uh, the globe and those basic capacities. We find the way to get our students over there. Uh, what do we need to be doing collectively to, yeah. to get much more of the scholars from other parts of the world Good question. moving around? Yep. Global health is still a concept, and um, basically, uh, nobody's actually funding global health. And what is sustaining a lot of these? You tell that to Bill Gates. <laughs> 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 what is sustaining this is funding for specific regions like HIV, chemo. Uh, we've had this wave for malnutrition, and there was very much acute. What would help sustain this is that there might be some other way of kidnapping people which might capture our attention like HIV did, but we are not sure of that. Are you concerned that since this is what is sustaining this wave, this, this sort of um, specific funding for specific diseases, that this may not be sustainable and it may not be enough to sustain institutions like the world? Because I, I remember people started calling them institutes of infection. Mm -hmm. My second point is that I think, just as Duke has formed partnerships with the World Health Organization, I think the consortium should do that early, not just to start. You're right. <laughs> Good point. No, I'll take one more. Tim Stevens from the Institute on Science for Global Health. Carolina uh, graduate. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not in we're not in basketball <laughs> I'm season. I'm fully aware of that. <laughs> U.S. educated global health um, workforce, or should we be looking for lower cost models for developing that kind of workforce? And if we can't, um, you know, I know I'm asking that rhetorically, but maybe we need some other programs to support the, the students' um, deferral or the, the cost, the high cost of education uh, that they incur. So I wonder if you've got any thoughts about that. So we can have those students mm -hmm. complement those. I mean, your um, right. Your question's a little bit. I mean, all these questions are interestingly a little bit related around the scheme of the theme of sustainability and and partnership. I mean, that, these are all very interesting questions. I think Jim's point. I mean, actually going from here to the Fogarty Center for a dinner to, with some people at the Fogarty Center to talk about this issue. Um, What we, what we really want is for our institute partners to be able to get sufficient support around the world, and to be able to be our partners, and not just to have a one-way street. I think Jim's point is extremely well taken. And within NIH, there, there is the Fogarty Center, which is great for this, but it has you know, a budget that's probably less than CSIS's. I mean, it's, it's really small, and it's very unfortunate how small it is. And and I, I just think that until we get um, more support for strengthening institutions abroad, this is going to be a challenge. The Gates Foundation has done some of this. Rockefeller used to do a lot of it, isn't doing it now. We don't have right now the resources th uh, that we need to do what needs to be done to strengthen these institutions in developing countries. A lot of the money that was made available through Fogarty in the past decade has been through AIDS research. And if you look at the, where the best AIDS research is done in the world now, and I say this without question, if you look at where the best research is done in Africa, let's just take Africa, it's the institutions that Fogarty Center strengthened over the past 15 years, 10, 15 years, 
through its, aid, its AIDS International Training and Research Program. It's, it's unquestionable. That's true. And it's the best example of what Jim is saying, that, that where the emphasis was made on strengthening those institutions, they became great partners with partners in the North. And we need more of that. And I wish I had an answer to Jim's question. I, I, I'm, we're all trying to advocate that Gates do more of that foundation. We're trying to advocate that the Wellcome Trust is doing more of that. That's, very, that's for sure in, in Africa. They just gave out a substantial number of grants to seven seven big grants to strengthen African institutions to collaborate with UK um, institutes. But I do think that, that that is a very critical area that we all need to lobby for and try to get more resources for. And you know, I, I, I can only agree with you, Jim. Um, on the sustainability issue, I mean, I've tried to make the same point that I'm also not sure you know, we want this field to continue. One reason for forming the consortium was to try to share and to give this field a, a, a decent birth so that it would be sustainable. And I am aware that some fields come and go, but then some fields like women's studies um, hang on, and environmental studies, for example. Many universities today have environmental studies, which they didn't have 10, 15 years ago. I think that we have some good, we have some good reasons to be optimistic. We have the continued support from the government. We have the Gates Foundation, which I don't, I mean, the Gates Foundation took a cut Instead of growing it at 17% this year, it's growing at 8%. Okay, I mean, we'd all like to have our, our um, retirement accounts, uh, you know, be that successful. So I think that, that um, we do have some signs, but I think you're absolutely right that we also need to have such consortia work with our partners abroad. And at our meeting in, in last year and at our meeting that's coming up, we've invited a number of partners from our partner institutions to come to the meeting. Because Gates is interested in forming a similar consortium in Africa and a similar consortium in Latin America and maybe in Asia if the, if the demand is there. So I'm hoping that what you're saying, um, what you're warning us about doesn't happen, but I think we have to work to continue to build on the enthusiasm that's out there. And I. As I think as long as our students are so committed, that's probably the best hope we have of this field uh, surviving and being strong. Um, you know, I, I, I do believe that um, your last question was on, on the workforce, right? Your, your question here. The focus was on the question of, of where we're going to get the workforce. Right. I think um, I'm, I told you I felt some guilt about this issue as someone who was pushing vertical programs and why I think we finally have turned the corner on this and recognized that the, the health system, the workforce and all that itself needs attention. You have the Global Health Workforce Alliance out of Geneva. You have the new IHP partnership, which I'm hoping the U.S. will eventually join. Of, of about 14, I think 11 or 12 nations trying to focus on about 10 or 11 countries together trying to strengthen the workforce. I think we need task shifting. I think we need to realize that a lot of things doctors do, nurses do, a lot of things nurses do, um, um, paramedics can do. I think we need to also think about what different tasks different w health workers can do. The doctors don't have to do everything. In fact, most things doctors do could be done by another healthcare worker. So I think we need to think about who does what, improve the management of the system, and have some uh, efforts by donors and by the World Bank, um, who's a major player here, major player in the IHP partnership is the World Bank. Well, I think we need, unfortunately, Gates is not a player in this. Bill Ga the Gates Foundation has not committed itself to this. It's primarily interested in product development and innovation for specific diseases which is okay if, every, if we have others that are committed to strengthening the health system and the workforce. I mean, I'm hoping the PEPFAR resources and the U.S. government will be more open to seeing our resources used, not just for in-service training to get more people treated, but actually to strengthen the health system. Because I think we've probably maxed out in Africa on how many people we're going to reach with antiretroviral drugs if we don't take what you're, what you're saying seriously. Um, and so I, uh, you know, there, there is much more momentum than there was. The question is, can it be maintained and, 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 and can it be expanded? And I think we have to continue to advocate because it always gets forgotten. Not all, always. It often gets forgotten in discussions. 
So I don't know if that's sufficient, but it is better than it was five years ago. The question is, can we, can we maintain it and grow it? More on the people in the, the, the fellow in the middle, right? The presentation. Please identify yourself. Oh, wonderful. Another university here. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Uh, Dr. Marson is, is a very productive presentation. Thank you very much. Very timely. I have three observations I would like to share with you. I think one of the reasons we departed from international health to global health to de-emphasize the political aspect of health. And things like health security or security issues, health diplomacy, I hope we, health will not be the victim of the politics. Um, you, want to expand, you want to expand on that a little bit? Yes, <laughs> I, I will try. One of the reasons is that I think I believe what you said. But at the same time, if health is got only for political purpose, then the whole concept of development will be defeated. So I'd rather say we will bring health, health diplomacy, under the umbrella of the development. Because that is the, that is the worst security system that we have in this world today. I can tell I'm in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> the second is that I think we need to work on more uh, between your challenges of the universities and the topics that you identified under global health. I think uh, if we can uh, bring more consistency, then we can see our path clear. And third, which is my bias, um, because I was trained in the reproductive health in the University of Michigan. If you look at the medium development goals, eight goals, five are related with health. Right. And definitely one of them very significant, uh, maternal child health, reproductive health issue. We were supposed to have, two thou after 2004, Cairo Conference, uh, 1994 Cairo Conference in 2004, and that didn't happen. So I hope, and 40% of the deaths happened due to the, as you know better than anybody else, to the MCH women. So I hope we can bring that back, because that maternal child health issues is the core corner of the health issues, in the particularly in the developing countries. Let me just say, I, I apologize I didn't mention that. The great, one of the greatest trav tra travesties is the, is the maternal mortality rate around the world. And that, that for sure. Now, it's somewhat a technical challenge, as you know. We don't have all the answers, but we sure can be doing a lot better. I just want to say, I, I, I could, I just want to say that on that, uh, I hope the U.S. government does. I, I'm, I'm hoping when President Obama goes to Ghana, we may hear something about this. But I'm really hoping that that we're going to get where you want to be on that one. Thank you very much. Okay, sure. Hi, Lillian Oh, wonderful. Oh, I can see you had some interesting discussions in the University of Washington. Watch out, Jim. I mean, you <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Ryan McFarland. I'm a AAAS policy fellow at the Department of Homeland Security. And my question relates to partnerships um, between universities involved in global health and the U.S. government. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what you see are the impediments and what are the potential targets of opportunity, particularly when you're representing the Department of State. Oh, wonderful. Policy. Nice. And, uh, my question is about the real private sector engagement, where you think the prospects are, and not just uh, big pharma drug development or big pharma serving as a grant making entity, but also potentially corporate, or utilization of corporate supply chains and mass, mass vaccination campaigns, or even uh, utilization of private sector human capital in, in university research initiatives. That's a good question. So, um, 
on the first question, um, well, I comment on reproductive health. I, I, I appreciate, I, I also am, I mean, I deliberately sh uh, in my talk showed the dollies and then showed where the money is going because I have a similar concern. I mean, it's sort of a trade-off a little bit because um, the money that's gone into AIDS, I mean, and, the, and, the, and, and malaria and um, has certainly galvanized uh, much of the government toward global health. I mean, PEPFAR, the p people, maybe a lot of people don't know this. The, the big thing that PEPFAR did is it transferred the responsibility for global health to the ambassador. I was on the PEPFAR evaluation team. I think Jim was, in, Jim was in part of that too. And one of the things that really struck me is you go to the field in PEPFAR and the ambassador, you can sit with the ambassador and talk about global health. I mean, that's, well, it wouldn't have been that way five years earlier. That's a really contribution to PEPFAR. And, you know, I don't know, we'll see if, if, the, if all the Obama money is used that way also. But even malaria, the few countries that are doing malaria, it's the same thing. It, you know, it's at the ambassador level. So I don't, I, I understand the disconnect. Um, and I'm, I think what we all need to do from a policy standpoint is keep reminding policymakers what the priorities are and not let politics become the dominant theme. On the other hand, we should capitalize on the great progress that's been made financially and politically for the field. So I, I take your point, and I think we all need to be balanced, to balance the, 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 these issues and uh, for the common good. I mean, you know, there are people like Laurie Garrett that are very, very concerned about this. I'm concerned, but on the other hand, I, I also feel we should capitalize on, on the achievements that have been made. And on the topics, you know, I, it's sort of related. I, I do agree that, that we need to remind ourselves, as I've already said, what, what the, and get some agreement, and that gets to your competency question. Um, there is an organization called GHEC, which actually I believe uh, you probably know from Seattle, the Global Health Education Consortium. They've been around 20 years developing um, curriculums in global health in medical schools, primarily. Someone, and uh, we are trying to come up with a way to, I, I don't know about incorporating, but certainly having a close partnership between GHEC and, and our consortium. Because one of our priorities for the next few years is to develop competencies. And, and, I, and I don't think competencies should be based on faculty members' interest. Uh, competencies should be based on what the student needs to learn to be a successful um, graduate in global health. And I mean, that's, you know, we're, we're starting this year We've just started a Master of Science in Global Health. And we've spent a lot of time thinking about what our competence should, should be. There's only one other Master of Science in Global Health in the country, and that's at UCSF. That's very much focused on global health governance. And we're, we've been thinking about what our competencies are going to be. And most of our thinking has not been around faculty interest, but very much around what we see are the priorities in global health and what needs to be learned to, be, to have a successful career. I would hope all universities would follow that path. Um, in terms of the, the obstacles with state per se, um, I think what, what we're faced with at state is that you're in Homeland Security, I think you said, that's, that's are you, okay, well, but, but that's new. And the money that's gone into OGAC at state is new, relatively new, four or five years. State never had this role before. And so I think, in fact, we were talking today before this meeting, you know, one of the things are, CSIS commission that Karen mentioned, this uh, policy commission that I'm, I'm on that commission. We're talking right now about uh, uh, this question of how we can um, rec make recommendations to state about how to provide monitoring and evaluation and, and uh, uh, for example, uh, oversight and what role universities could play and other actors could play in, in working with state. As I understand state traditionally, even, f even through legislation, there's certain laws which, which limit the, the amount of input that, that state can have from the outside. Maybe I'm not saying it correctly, but is that, is that something? So, so I think that, that but I, I'm hoping that there'll be more openness to uh, allowing the expertise in American universities to uh, provide guidance to state. I mean, certainly if you look at NIH or CDC, there's a lot of involvement at, at, of universities in, in review panels or in, even in councils and various mechanisms are used. And I, I would hope we could see some of that at state. I think a lot of it is the newness 
and, and try and, and maybe not enough awareness of, of how to do it. And I'm, I'm hoping that one of the, this will be one issue our commission is going to take up. Now on the private sector, um, I think corporate social responsibility has arrived. I don't think it's just a gimmick. I think it's for real. I mean, let's, let's face it, farmers got serious, much of farmer now has serious challenges. I mean, you know all the layoffs and, and that many, much of farmer has faced, which is really not good for research and development, that's for sure. So, so I think, though, that, that corporate social responsibility, much of it out of the embarrassment over the age drugs, has, has really happened, at least in, in the pharma world. And if you talk to, um, you know, ExxonMobil or, or, some, or, the, or the gold mining companies, the mining companies in, um, in South and Southern Africa or the beer companies, I think there's a genuine, uh, I mean, there's always a profit motive in what their livelihood is, but I think there's a genuine desire to help and to be part of this movement and to feel that they can contribute. And one way they certainly can contribute is in management. My, I mean, I, I don't know if Guy's um, interacted much with the business, the, the business sector in terms of how they can help business schools, but, but certainly they have a lot to offer. And, and I hope you will, uh, you know, I, I hope that that will happen. Um, you know, I, I, I am feeling quite positive about the approach that the business community is taking toward global health. And uh, I mean, there'll always be exceptions and there'll always be issues over patents and pricing of drugs and all that, and I don't want to seem naive. But I, but I do think that the, the, the general um, approach of the business community is positive toward making a difference today. I think it's in their corporate interest to do so. Um, I mean, the other sector, which you didn't mention, but I, is, is the faith-based sector. Um, I think one thing, one very positive, another, you know, there are a number of positive lessons from PEPFAR, but one of them is that um, th the faith-based sector really matters, and uh, we need to work closely with the faith-based sector in management training that I mentioned they need, but they, they can outreach to populations in ways that no one else can. And, trying to work with them in a positive way, I think, and making them a true partner in global health, like the business sector, is really important. So I just finish on that. Anyway, thank you, Dr. Merson, and thank you all for coming.